Honorable Minister for Animal Husbandry, Dairies and Fisheries Development, Shri Mahadev Jankar, Mr. Anup Kumar, the Secretary, Government of Maharashtra for Animal Husbandry, Dairy and Fisheries Development, Ambassador Modgil, Mr. Ravi Baratkar, the President of MEDC, and my dear friend and colleague, Commander Deepak Nayak, we've been colleagues in the Navy. Excellencies, distinguished guests, eminent participants, ladies and gentlemen, and my dear cadets who are the future of Maritime India. It is indeed a distinct honor for me to be present here today for the first ever Blue Economy Conclave, and it is a privilege to share my thoughts with such an august audience. Oceans are central to life on Earth. They are rich in oil and mineral resources. They are the suppliers of oxygen, absorbers of carbon dioxide, a virtual heat sink rich in biodiversity, which have emerged as the global economic highways for transit of seaborne trade. With depletion of resources on land, humankind has turned towards the seas for resources. And there is a misperception that the oceans are an unending resource base and an infinite sink. Nothing could be further away from reality. Over the past few decades, we have witnessed indiscriminate pollution of the seas and contamination of the natural marine habitat, resulting in a detrimental impact of climate change on the oceans. Studies have indicated that nearly 80% of all pollutants in the oceans emanate from land. And if the current rate of pollution continues, in a few decades from now, we will have more plastic in the ocean than fish. The concept of blue economy has emerged as a new paradigm. And I would like to define harnessing the blue economy as the economic development of all our maritime interests by optimal and efficient utilization of resources with minimum impact on the environment to ensure sustainable development of the oceans. India is essentially a maritime nation, and the Indian seaboard has been the vortex of intense maritime activity over centuries. We have a glorious maritime heritage spanning over 5,000 years. The Indus Valley civilization, which existed in the western part of the country, dates back to 3,300 BC. Even today, we have a dry dock at Lothal in Gujarat, which dates back to 2,200 BC. It is from these small ports that ancient mariners sailed off to distant lands in Mesopotamia, ancient Egypt, and east coast of Africa. On the east coast of India, we had the seafaring kingdoms of the Kalingas, the Cholas, the Pandyas, and Cheryas, who sailed off to Southeast Asian countries. And even today, we can see glimpses of India's glorious maritime heritage in all these countries of Southeast Asia. India ruled the seas right up to the 16th century, when we, till when we had the largest GDP in the world. And we gave away the supremacy of the seas because of our neglect of the oceans. And with the arrival of the European powers, starting off with Vasco da Gama, who landed on the shores of Calicut on 20th of May, 1498. The Portuguese were followed by the Dutch, the British, and the French. But it is little known that even during the British period, we had a glorious shipbuilding tradition right here at Mumbai, where we are all seated. Some of the most famous warships were built during that period. Nearly about 115 warships with 84 gunships for the Royal Navy were built here at Mumbai 
at Bombay docks, as it was then called, and many, many hundreds of merchant ships. Some of the most famous ships in the world were built during that period. The oldest warship afloat in the world today is HMS Trincomalee, which is based in Hartlepool in UK, and that was built in India at Mumbai in 1817, 200 years ago. The national anthem of United States of America, the Star Spangled Banner, was written by Francis Key in Baltimore on board a ship, HMS Minden. And that ship, HMS Minden, ladies and gentlemen, was built in India. The Treaty of Nanking ceding Hong Kong to the British was signed on board yet another famous warship on 29th of August, 1842. And that warship was HMS Cornwallis, also built in India. Regrettably, when the transition took place from sail to steam and wood to steel, we got left behind because India then was not part of the Industrial Revolution. And the revival of our maritime capabilities took place after independence. In recent years, under the leadership of our Honorable Prime Minister Sri Narendra Modi, there have been a series of initiatives for sustainable development in the maritime domain. The Honorable Prime Minister has linked the blue chakra or the wheel on our national flag with our potential to harness the blue economy. He has also outlined his vision for the Indian Ocean as Sagar, which means the ocean, and the acronym stands for security and growth for all in the region. India has vast maritime interests, which are also enablers of our blue economy. And I will highlight some of the maritime sectors which are witnessing significant growth in the coming years. And they will also act as avenues for maritime cooperation to harness the blue economy with our littoral neighbors. The first is the port infrastructure development sector, where the government has launched its ambitious Sagarmala project, which is a port-led development initiative based on four pillars of port modernization, connectivity, port-led industrialization, and coastal community development. Sagarmala envisages development of transshipment hubs, development of greenfield projects with minimum impact on the environment. Also, we will see connectivity between our major and minor ports to the hinterland through road and rail connectivity, as well as development of inland waterways. As you're all aware, India has approximately 14,500 kilometers of navigable inland waterways. And in the first phase, the government is developing about 4,500 kilometers as five major national waterways. Currently, 94% of trade and freight on land in India moves by road or rail. The development of inland waterways and increase in coastal shipping will ensure the enhancement of percentage of transportation over water, which is safer, cheaper, and cleaner. India has a vibrant shipbuilding industry with over 27 shipyards, and recently the government has given a major boost to the shipbuilding industry by according it the special infrastructure status and also permitting 100% foreign direct investment into shipbuilding. It should be our endeavor to see that the future ships are built in accordance with the Energy Efficiency Design Index approved by the IMO, and to see that future ships are propelled by environmentally friendly fuel. An area I would like to particularly mention, and taking on from where I, what I said earlier, is the aspect of warship building in this country. I mentioned to you that we had a glorious warship building tradition. But soon after independence, we took on this tradition. The Navy prepared its first perspective plan, which included indigenous shipbuilding way back in 1948. We inducted naval architects in 1955. Independent India built its first naval war vessel in 1961. And we set up our Naval Design Directorate in 1964. So for 
over 50 years now, our naval designers have been designing and our shipyards have been building ships for the Indian Navy, transformation from a buyer's Navy to a builder's Navy. Today, it's a matter of great pride for every Indian that all the 40 ships and submarines under construction for the Indian Navy are being built in Indian shipyards, both public and private. This is one of the finest examples that I can give of the Make in India initiative. India also has a very vibrant and thriving fishing industry with over 250,000 fishing boats, with 4 million active fishermen, more than 14 million people part of the fishing community, and our annual production in the region of 11.41 million metric tons makes us the third largest fish producing nation in the world. But ladies and gentlemen, that is only scratching the surface because 90% of fishing in Indian waters is restricted to our coastal areas. Whereas we have the entire 200 nautical miles of the exclusive economic zone to be exploited. There is hardly any fishing in deep Indian waters and it is said that fish in deep Indian waters are actually dying of old age. The government has promulgated the national fisheries policy in 2017. And this will give an impetus both to deep sea sustainable fisheries as well as the aquaculture and fish farming along the coast. India has over 1,300 islands and islets as part of the Andaman and Nicobar group, the Lakshadweep group, and islands off the west and east coast of India. The government has prepared a comprehensive island development plan taking into account aspects of security, economic sustenance, environment preservation, social and cultural sustenance. The aim is to develop greenfield infrastructure projects with nearly zero carbon footprint to promote controlled ecotourism, cruise tourism, development of marinas, and all the marine tourism activities. This will open up avenues for connectivity in the islands and for cruise tourism in the Bay of Bengal, which is the largest bay in the world. And we have six of our countries located on the rim of the bay. The other areas where we are likely to witness significant growth include offshore oil and gas exploration, deep seabed mining, and renewable sources of ocean energy, including the offshore wind energy, the wave and tidal energy, and ocean thermal energy conversion. We can therefore see that we have an ocean of opportunities to harness the blue economy. The challenge, however, is to ensure that these are exploited in accordance with the norms laid down by the United Nations Agenda 2030 and the Sustainable Development Goals. I'm sure that during the vibrant deliberations at this conference, we will come up with some path-breaking ideas and suggestions to harness the blue economy. In conclusion, I would like to highlight four major takeaways. But my recommendation is that we have had enough discussion and deliberation on the issue of blue economy. It is now time for action. And therefore, I would suggest that first of all, knowing that we have a great potential for the blue economy as a maritime nation, we need to draw up a national level maritime policy to harness the blue economy in accordance with the Sustainable Development Goals. Second, we need to have an apex level organization to coordinate and integrate the vast number of initiatives being taken by a large number of departments and agencies which operate in the maritime domain to ensure the economic development of our maritime interests 
in sync and coordination with the initiatives of the blue economy. In order to fully implement the vision of our Honorable Prime Minister of his concept of Sagar or security and growth for all in the region, we need to draw up a roadmap for maritime cooperation with our literal neighbors to harness the blue economy. The Honorable Prime Minister has launched a dynamic initiative of Swachh Bharat or Clean India. We need to extend this concept to Swachh Sagar or clean and healthy oceans for our future generations. The seas around us are gaining newfound importance as each day goes by. And I have no doubt that the current century is the century of the seas. India has vast maritime interests, which have a vital relationship with the nation's economic growth and are also enablers of our blue economy. The initiatives which have been taken in the maritime domain in recent years are pointers to indicate that India has once again turned towards the seas and is destined to emerge as a resurgent maritime nation in the 21st century.